interpretation there from a legal point of view. But the worst of all is that the man manager of this uh, com company uh, uh, aimed, uh, earned uh, 18,000 US dollars a month. That's what I earn in nine months. He earned in one month without any investment being uh, made. So I'd like to tell you that uh, three years ago we started preparing for the nationalization and the former president, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero of Spain, uh, told me here at the UN in New York that he would guarantee that the company would invest. Unfortunately, in the dialogue that we've had with our company, all we've done is lose uh, over three years. And it should have been nationalized three years ago, in fact. And now, now we're seeing that the airport terminals are very small. And since we have an, an economic uh, upswing, uh, a lot of people want to travel, but the airports are too small because there hasn't been investment in the airport terminals. So we were obliged to nationalize, and of course now we're going to invest in them. That's just one example of how companies operate, but the companies that are partners like Repsol from Spain, they are excellent partners. They invest, we work together very well. If companies invest, let me tell you that the investment is guaranteed and you can also uh, recover um, your investment. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, total Repsol, Petrobras uh, from Brazil. But, but some, some um, companies, and I'd like to say to, to Spain and the Spanish people, that perhaps because of some bad apples, some bad companies, there are some diplomatic differences that we're experiencing. But it's not the fault of the Spanish government, and it's not the fault of the Spanish people. It's the fault of some companies who just come to Bolivia to rob the country, take money home without investing to improve our airports. They, so they, as I said, they, they, their um, CEO was huge, earning these huge uh, sums with uh, no investment, and uh, all parties uh, uh, have been this in Spain uh, have been supporting this nationalisation, and, uh, and we also uh, nationalised Electropass in uh, December. Now in the city. Uh, it was 60 cents per kilowatt hour, and in the uh, c uh, country, uh, uh, it should have been cheaper. How is it possible, however, that that wasn't the case, and m my um, brothers and sisters were having to pay more? Um, we negotiated to try and get one single price, but we had to force that decision through. And next month, next month. Uh, brothers uh, in rural areas, indigenous peoples, for per kilowatt hour will pay 0.60 uh, cents. So these are social policies that we have to implement in order to improve the social and economic situation, particularly for those that have been most abandoned. On uh, President Chavez. Well, again, let me say uh, how much respect and admiration I have for both Fidel and Hugo. In the first and second years of my administration, 2006-2007, uh, their help with social policy, the uh, miracle vision, uh, support for our productive sector, uh, support for small-scale projects from Venezuela was so important for consolidating the change uh, in Bolivia. And it really does um, pain me that, um, that uh, Fidel Castro is no longer president, and uh, particularly as well now that uh, my brother, President Chavez, is in a very difficult spot with his health. And I remember both of them told me, Evo, you have to look after yourself. You have to rest. And now, and, and they were telling me to rest. 
and uh, and I didn't, uh, I wasn't listening to them, and now I do see that uh, they weren't uh, resting either. And we've been uh, speaking with uh, the the doctors. He, they tell us he's resting. He's still under treatment. We've spoken with the family. Uh, the family is uh, strengthened, of course. So the fact that uh, President Chavez is back in uh, Venezuela is strengthening them all. Uh, the day before yesterday, I w went to an intercultural uh, farmers uh, event, and all of the leaders that spoke there uh, uh, I I I expressed uh, their thanks for this organization, but above all, they said, well, fortunately, our brother Chavez is back in uh, Venezuela. Our brother Rafael Correa has been re-elected in Ecuador. When presidents uh, are, are part of historic century, uh, once in a century uh, changes, people recognize this work of presidents and commanders in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I hope that President Chavez will soon once again be at the helm of uh, the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, uh, as always serving his people. Particularly in the Syrian crisis and in the Iran nuclear, with the Iranian nuclear program problems with America. How, does you, how do you view those crises and what advice do you have from your example in Latin America that you may pass on to the people of the Middle East? Mm. Well, first, some powers have no authority nor ethics, nor moral authority as presidents to speak about nuclear weapons. Secondly, conflicts, conflicts within countries is provoked by capitalism, and then they intervene militarily. A good example is Libya and Gaddafi. It was the Libyan oil for some powers. I should say I was in a meeting with heads of state in Europe and I was asking one of the presidents, well now who's in charge of Libyan oil? And the president said, no, don't ask me, ask the other president, another European president. So with the pretext of social conflict, uh, nuclear weapons, drug trafficking, or weapons of mass destruction for humanity. These are all pretexts to intervene and take over the natural resources in that country. We understand exactly what's going on. Anti-capitalist governments and anti-imperialist governments are accused of being drug trafficking and fomenting internal conflict. And then, of course, you need an intervention. But ultimately, it's not social it's really about natural resources, not social conflict. That's why Bolivia does not believe in war or interventions, nor does it want to discuss that in the United Nations, if there's a democracy or no democracy in the United Nations. It's not possible that all the countries of the United Nations would be subject to the Security Council. What Security Council? It's an insecurity council for mankind around the world. That would be another discussion. So. Well, as peoples, we need to avoid any social conflict. That's not the issue. Without social conflict, there would be no reason for intervening. There are groups where uh, conflict is fostered by the government of the United States. They create conflict, as they have tried to do in Bolivia and other places, and then justify a coup d'etat, as they've done in Latin America as well. In Bolivia, after approving the new constitution, we have become a peaceful country, pacifist. We don't provoke anyone, but everyone should also uh, be prepared if there's any kind of territorial aggression against us. I come from the culture of life, not from the culture of death. I do not share policies or actions 
around death as being planned by the Security Council. And there we have huge differences of opinion as a president, as a government, and as a country within the United Nations. Once again, that will be an ongoing discussion in order to demo make the United Nations more democratic. Another example is the economic blockade against Cuba, the embargo. Two or three countries reject it. All countries in the world support Cuba. So why does the United Nations not make the resolutions be complied with? Israel and the United States reject, and then all the rest of the countries in the world are subject to the will of the United States and Israel. What democracy? And we could give many other examples of what happens in the world like that. What about relations between Chile and Bolivia right now? Like the example of the soldiers who were taken prisoner and also the passage to the sea. I think you very much for talking about soldiers such as CNN and not talk about CNN talking about officials. They were drafted into the military and they are serving the military because it's compulsory. They were used to fight against smugglers. They were chasing smugglers. I think that there's a political purpose to them being detained. For I think for the first time in history in Bolivia or of the two countries, like Chile and Bolivia. We've said it truthfully. We've said it using historical arguments. We've used legal arguments. And above and beyond that, we've said it to their face, in their homes, and in front of 60 countries. We've talked about the situation of the passage to the sea for Bolivia. And it bothered them. It bothered the government of Chile. And now they have taken revenge with three soldiers. I think it's lacking in humility, not because of the people of Chile, but the government and the president. Our soldiers are now heroes and defenders of the sea. It's not because the president and the authorities have an issue with us about the whole passage to the sea issue that they should then arrest our soldiers. This is tension between governments and presidents, but there are peoples. Fortunately, there are people in Chile who support our sovereign claim to the passage to the sea. I should say here there are enormous contradictions in the President Piñera's policies. First, he said.